Okay, you, you may have spotted that the title of the talk has changed, because um, <coughs> I, I, I couldn't for the life of me remember it, and I was really struggling to come up with a title. What you're going to be subjected to is me sort of trying to think out loud about how to try and connect the world to taxonomy and barcoding. So I want to start with the two graphs in the title. Technology, yay. This is the first one. So this is a, a chart of the number of new animal names that have been published over time at the level of species and subspecies. And so down here, here's the present day, numbers of new names each year, key events, World War I, bad for taxonomy, World War II, very bad for taxonomy. Uh, 1923 is the Mickey Mouse year. This is the sort of cutoff for copyright, which we might come back to later. The key point on this diagram is that Taxonomy has effectively plateaued in terms of the numbers of new names it publishes each year, taken across all animal groups together. Now, I had a very animated discussion with Stuart Pym at lunch yesterday. There are some groups which this is not true. So for spiders, the number of names each year is going up. But for other groups like gastropods, it's flat. And for nematodes, who cares about nematodes? Nematodes are going down like this. <laughs> so if you average them all together, in total, the total taxonomic output for animals has essentially remained constant since about 1970 onwards. So that's one graph. And you can look at a graph like that and maybe think, what does that mean? Uh, maybe it suggests that taxonomists are working to capacity. There's no more that they can do. Some have suggested that graphs like this, coupled with the idea that there are more and more taxonomists around, or more and more taxonomists publishing, perhaps are running out of species. Um, I'm not sure how many people in the room would support that idea, but some people have argued that. But the major sort of implication from my point of view is that the vast majority of taxonomic information and taxonomic work is legacy. It is in the past. No matter what point you are, the vast majority of stuff has been done beforehand. Now, contrast that with, this is a bit of an old grotty slide. This is the growth of GenBank. So all kind of sequences that have been in GenBank, and this goes back to, uh, this is the start of GenBank here in 1982. This is uh, 2008, so you can see it's quite old. But even then, there's an exponential growth in sequences. You can imagine that it's sort of you know, way up here today. So that's a very, very different kind of picture. So in fact, the vast majority of sequencing is gonna happen in the future. So by the end of next year, for example, we'll have vastly more data, sequence data, <coughs> than we do now. That's not the case for taxonomy. At the end of next year, taxonomy will have a little bit more data. The vast majority we already have got. So I get very worried looking at these two graphs because they seem to show very, very kind of different patterns. And maybe we can simplify that a little bit. So basically, we've got taxonomy like this, kind of flatlining, sort of producing information at a constant rate, and sequences are just going ballistic like that. And I guess the question is, you know, what are the implications of that for taxonomy and for sequencing genomics and barcoding? So just to give you one practical consequence of this. This is my Halloween slide, dark taxa. <laughs> so what is a dark taxon? So I use this term to refer to a species that has been sequenced, the sequence is in GenBank. It hasn't gone into GenBank with a proper scientific name. So it's kind of something we don't really know quite what it is. So to give you an example of this, this is a plot that's looking at um, the number of species, in this case mammalian species, that go into GenBank each year, what proportion of those have a proper Latin name, somebody says they know what it is, and what don't. So in the early days, you know, people would stick stuff in, occasionally you'd get a sheep or a rabbit, but most people were good and told you exactly what it was. As time went on, the proportion of, of sequences that are added that had a proper name started to drop a bit, and about here, 2009, 2010, it just plummeted down. So the things in blue are things that people know what they are, was who said they know what they are. The things here in the sort of orangey red, we don't know. If you look at um, invertebrates, quote unquote, you get uh, a similar kind of pattern, seem more dramatic. So again, the early days, maybe about 80 or 90% we knew what they were. By about 2009, only about half of the stuff going into GenBank, people were prepared to put Latin names on, the rest they didn't. And then this is the barcode effect. So a huge bit of barcodes went into GenBank and it plummeted down to about, what, about 10% of stuff going in that year actually had Linnaean names on them. So these things are dark taxa, the things that we don't actually have Latin names on them. Why do they matter? 
Well, I think it, part of it symbolizes this kind of disconnect between taxonomy and genomics. Taxonomists, we fret about Latin names. Uh, it gives the impression that people doing genomics don't really quite so much. And also, what are these dark taxa? Are they species that we actually know what they are and we have just been too lazy to put names on? Or the taxonomist that could have told us what they are is dead? Or are they genuinely new things? And at the moment, it's really hard to tease those two things apart, whether they're things we've already found, just happened to have sequenced for the first time, or brand new exciting stuff. So that's an example of this kind of mismatch between taxonomy and sequencing. And it's a consequence of this graph. So what I want to do now is try and think of, so what could we do? What would be some sort of responses to that particular picture? So I've come up with um, three. So the idea here is, is there's, there's various different things you could try and do. So one approach is to basically say, okay, so the issue is taxonomy. Uh, what could we do to sort of make this more sort of digital and more sort of modern in some sense, maximize our access to that information in some way? Or we could say, look, sequences are way cool. Look at this. Uh, this is where the fun is. Let's go and do that. Or if we're feeling really kind of noble or masochistic, we could figure out some way is there some way to sort of integrate those two? And I should stress, when I talk about things like integrating these things, I'm not talking about specific projects necessarily. You might, in an individual study, look at taxonomy, look at barcodes, try and combine them. I'm thinking at the kind of scale of, you know, all the big taxonomic databases, all the sequence databases, how do we get them sort of talking? Okay. So let's look at taxonomy. So this is the fundamental problem faced by taxonomic information. It, it looks like this, and this is awesome. Lots of specimens, books on shelves, it's wonderful. It's all analog, and in today's digital world is basically useless. So, of course, the big challenge is how do we get that stuff digitized so we can do cool stuff like this. So this is um, GBIF, this um, really weirdly colored map. This is half a billion records of where things are on the planet. About half of those are museum specimens, about half of them uh, citizen science observations, uh, primarily of birds. So first approximation, GBIF is a database of birds. Um, but you can only do this kind of thing if this information has been digitized. So one approach is to digitize collections and specimens. The aspect of digitization that I actually am um, much more excited about is digitizing literature. Hands up those people who've heard of the Biodiversity Heritage Library. Quite a few. I think it's, it's one of the most awesome projects we have got going in the biodiversity arena. Essentially, here's BHL over here. They are digitizing huge numbers of publications and putting them online, completely open access for free. Now, one sort of slight myth about BHL, the reason I showed 1923 in the first chart is originally BHL said, we will look at stuff that's just out of copyright, which in the US means before 1923. In fact, they've done deals with museums and societies. The stuff that's been published even a few months ago is now actually appearing in BHL. Now, I think this is kind of, BHL is very like a genome project in a sense that sequencing projects take organisms, convert them to strings of letters. It's exactly what BHL does. It takes books, converts them to strings of letters. So it's pumping out genomes that we call books. And the next thing you want to do, if you've got a genome, you want to annotate it, you want to find genes. The equivalent for BHL is to find articles. And so this is a project that, that I set up called Biostore, which is trying to find articles within that huge set of books. So it's kind of like finding genes uh, within a genome. Once you've got access to the literature, you're opening up all that kind of wonderful wealth of taxonomic information, original descriptions, descriptions of ecology, and so on. And you want to do stuff with that. And so one of my sort of other obsessions lately has been wouldn't it be wonderful if for every name, for every organism, and I'm, I'm a zoologist, so at the moment I'm focusing on animals, we'll do plants at some point, we could go from that name to the original taxonomic description, and not actually just have it as a citation, be able to see it and read it and ultimately work with it. So that's what BioNames is trying to do. It's building on what BHL are doing, BHL are pumping up literature, let's make that kind of link. So one response to this whole sort of problem is, what can we do to mobilize all the information in taxonomy? So that's about, you know, barcoding is about digitizing life, converting it to letters. Let's do the equivalent for specimens, for literature. And then the hard sort of task becomes of trying to link all that information together of names to description. So the first kind of response to this chart, I guess, is 
let's mobilize as much as we can out of the taxonic legacy. Now, a second response, and I'm really kind of tempted by this sometimes, is just to say, I can't be bothered with taxonomy anymore. Uh, this is where the fun is. There's so much cool stuff happening with sequences. Um, let's pretend for a moment that we're microbiologists. So people studying bacteria, I think there's something like 6,000 described bacteria species, which is tiny. And that's purely because in order to get a Latin name, you've got to be cultured. There are, of course, vastly more species of bacteria. And microbiologists seem to get along fine without Linnaean name. So let's imagine if we sort of set aside taxonomy and just ask the question, if barcodes were all we had, what would we do? What sort of visualizations, for example, could we come up with? So there are some very kind of simple ones. This is one. Um, I started playing with a bold database. And was, is, uh, one of the nice things about bold is you can actually grab the data and play with it yourself. So this is a little visualization I made. This is about 2 million barcodes stuck on a map. And uh, Brazil and tropical Africa and India are kind of noticeably absent. But you kind of get a sense of the kind of density of coverage. And you can click on one of these and you get the kind of pretty pictures of the specimens. For some reason, it's full of lepidopterans and so on. So this is one kind of very kind of simple visualization. And this is the kind of thing that, you know, for example, GBIF does with museum data. Um, but barcodes, we can do a bit more than that. So barcodes, we have sequences. Maybe we can do something a bit more interesting. So another little thing I've been playing with, this is um, the idea that if you've got a set of barcodes and you've got them georeferenced, you can put them on a map, but of course, the DNA sequences, you can make a tree. And wouldn't it be nice to have an automated tool that put the tree on the map so you could see it? So this is some barcodes for an uh, Australian marsupial. And you can see these are the kind of clusters geographically. These are the clusters phylogenetically. There's a nice, very clean break between those two clusters kind of there. So you could imagine just you know, automatically computing these kind of trees. And suddenly, phy phylogeography becomes something that we could do uh, very, very quickly. So these are just some, a couple of ideas. They're obviously far, far too simple. Uh, they're, not, they're not integrated in any way, because what you really want, I think, is something like that, click a dot, and automatically get that. So I think there's all kinds of uh, challenges that we could sort of engage with in terms of visualizing this kind of data. So we just think about what sequences can do, what are the sort of things we can play with. So here are some challenges. It would be kind of nice if we had a complete evolutionary tree for all the barcodes. That's what, about two or so million barcodes at the moment. That's a pretty big tree. That's computationally going to be quite a challenge to build. It'd be kind of fun to have one. And if we had a tree, or perhaps some other kind of method, could we very quickly compute the total sequence diversity of a particular area? So you can imagine this could be a proxy for the measure of biodiversity. It would be something you could quantify. Draw me a box on a map, click a button. This is the total sequence diversity in that area. And also, um, can we visualize interactions between organisms? We've seen some of this already with um, Charles and Naomi uh, yesterday. So I just want to show you two very quick sort of ideas on the, along this line. Yeah. So this is a slide I made um, about a couple of days ago, and I'm really kind of regretting it. But <laughs> what, what I'm trying to do here is, so say, say you've got 2 million barcodes. Most methods for looking at relationships between sequences require you to compare the sequences. So that's 2 million by 2 million. That gets really, really difficult. What I'm interested in is, is there some way that you can take a single sequence and figure out where it exists in some kind of sort of sequence space? And so if, if you get, gave me, say, you know, 100,000 sequences, could I just give you a chart of whereabouts in sequence space they appear as a very quick and dirty visualization? So you could imagine comparing, I don't know, could you compare uh, barcodes from a marine environment, barcodes from terrestrial, and just by looking at a picture like this, you'd actually better tell that just by looking at the sequences. So this is a technique that calls, uh, uses DNA walks. Um, don't worry about the details, it doesn't work. Um, I'm still trying to work on something else. But the, the goal here is, once you start getting millions of sequences, the sort of POIs comparison thing becomes really kind of hard to do. Finally, we've encountered a lot about visualizing uh, ecological communities. And this is a, a one way of doing this on a kind of grand scale. What you're seeing here is something, and this is, uh, I, just to annoy Jonathan Eisen, I've called this a symbiome. The idea here is what you're seeing is this is around this curve here, the tree of life. These are bacteria, green plants, fungi, and animals taken from GenBank. And there's a line connecting 
two species on that diagram. If there's a sequence in GenBank, say from an insect, and they tell you it's from an oak tree, you get a line connecting the insect with the oak tree. So you're building up ecological associations. And this is purely just by data mining GenBank. So for example, here are crustaceans over here. Crustaceans have some relationships over here with various kind of worms. These relationships here are parasites of vertebrates. So these are crustacea that are fish lice, and these are whale lice. So you've got this kind of insects as parasites of vertebrates. You can compare them with, um, sorry, crustaceans as parasites of vertebrates. Compare them with insects, you get the same kind of thing. Again, insects are parasites of vertebrates, in this case, terrestrial ones, uh, bird lice and mammal lice. What's the major difference between crustaceans and insects? Well, you can see ecologically there's this huge connectivity between insects and green plants. Crustacea don't have that as an option. There's hardly any green plants in the sea. So, for example, in a very kind of arm movie fashion, why are insects so diverse? Well, they have all these kind of relationships. So you could imagine just sort of doing kind of uh, this sort of broad brush kind of ecological association at a kind of global, global scale just by using these kind of associations between sequences. Okay, so we can have some fun in a sequence-only world. Uh, the final sort of response is, is there some way that we can link this stuff together? So we might try and link, for example, classical taxonomy with barcodes using taxonomic names. And that sort of works a bit, but as soon as you have dark taxa, things get really kind of problematic. Lots of things don't have names. If we do have names, um, sometimes the names don't mean what we think they mean. So here's one example. This is a nice little skink that's found in Australia. If you go to GBIF, you get this beautiful distribution like here. It's in southwest Australia, in the southeastern Australia. It's glorious. If you go and grab one of those um, individuals and have it barcoded, this is just a small part of the distribution of that skink. Here are some barcodes. This is the evolution of the tree. Uh, the different color schemes, the different bins. And suddenly, what was one thing widely distributed like this, we're just looking at this little tiny patch here, it's exploded into multiple kind of units. And I'm sure many of you doing barcodes will discover this. Classically determined species start to explode into sort of lots of little subunits. So this, this term reefier obscura, it's not totally obvious what it means in the context of taxonomic specimens and in barcodes. Maybe we could integrate taxonomy and barcodes using specimens. I mean, after all, barcodes have vouchers. If you're doing a job properly, you'll have a voucher specimen. Uh, databases like GBIF have huge numbers of specimens coming in from museum collections. Um, we could ask one question, um, why isn't bold in GBIF? It seems kind of odd that we have this kind of huge database of voucher specimens from barcodes, huge database of museum specimens, and they're not sort of together. And it occurs, and actually, if you look closely at GBIF, parts of the barcode database is already there, which is maybe a good thing and maybe not such a good thing. So for example, there are organizations who have, as well as doing barcoding, have put their voucher specimens into GBIF. And here's one here, let me attempt some German, Zoologische Stadtsammlung München. So they have put a big collection of Lepidoptera into GBIF, and each one of these is a voucher specimen for a DNA barcode. What that means is that here's a nice little lepidopter, oh, wrong one, in bold. And you can see that's a specimen code there. GBIF already has that. So if bold was to put its data into GBIF, we'd actually get two, two copies of that same thing. Ironically, this barcode is actually already in GBIF with another route. All the georeference sequences in GenBank have been coded up and put into GBIF by the European uh, Molecular Biology Laboratory, UNBL. So in fact, right now at the moment, GBIF has this record and this record, which both refer to that. So at the moment, we've got two bits of information for the same thing. If the barcode's going, we're going to have three bits. So one of the problems we have is we're going to get massive duplication of information once we sort of start putting in the barcodes in because some of the museum specimens have already gone in. If we put in GenBank independently of barcodes, we're going to have quite an interesting kind of situation. The other use of specimens, and this has come up with a really nice um, session that Pete Hollingsworth and Scott Miller were doing on, on type specimens. In many ways, taxonomy is really, really simple. You have some specimens, you stick some names on them. I've got two species over here. Each one of them has a type specimen with a name attached. Let's imagine I decide there's actually t those two things are actually the same species. I put them together, and I've got two types. What's the name of the species? It's the name that's the oldest one. So this one was published before that one. This one wins, 
that's the name of the species. So another kind of fairly obvious way to kind of integrate classical taxonomic information, for example, databases of specimens and the barcodes, would be let's go barcode all the types. And one way perhaps we could do this is do we have a, a central repository that tells us all the type specimens? Well, not exactly, but GBIF comes pretty close. You can go to GBIF and say, give me all the list of holotype specimens. Now, this almost works. So I tried this. I tried this for birds. And GBIF has about 11,500 uh, type specimens of birds, holotype specimens. If you look closely, for about 6,500, GBIF doesn't understand the scientific names that are on those birds. And sometimes it gets so badly wrong that this is probably a bit hard to see. This is a type specimen for all birds. And if you're a taxonomist, you know that's logically totally impossible. You can have type specimens for species or subspecies, but not for a class. And what's happened here is, you know, one of the classic failings of the biodiversity informatics community. We do not have a standardized list of every name that's ever been published for every organism. And this is, I'm sure people have, have heard this from many people for decades now. Because of that, because there's no list that GBIF can use, it doesn't understand what half these type specimens refer to. So there's potential for sort of integrating these things in this way. It's going to be quite sort of challenging. Okay, so back to my three charts. So I guess what I've been trying to do is sort of think out loud in a sense about given these two very different kind of distributions of, of information being produced in taxonomy and then sequences, what are the kind of sensible things we could do? I'm a lapsed taxonomist. I started out doing upper taxonomy of crabs, so part of me would really like to do as much as possible to mobilize that information, particularly in the scientific literature. It's a huge resource. Most of it is still analog. Let's make that digital. So maybe one response to try and bring all that taxonomic information into the 21st century. Part of me just thinks that's hard work. Sequences are really cool. There's some neat things you can do. You can sort of just sort of close your eyes about taxonomy a bit and experiment with what can you do in terms of visualizations and analysis of sequences. I'm very kind of tempted to do that. Um, this is going to be super hard work. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be frustrating. Um, it, but I think it's one of the things that ultimately we're going to have to try and do. Um, so anybody who's uh, feeling noble, brave, or completely nuts, um, there's work to be done here. Thanks very much for your time.